right, so I'm talking to you about uh, Python instead of uh, Lua or, or JavaScript. Um, I won't give an introduction to what Python is. I hope most people know or have heard of it at least. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scripting language, of course, um, but unlike the other two um, languages that have come before me, Python is meant to be uh, kitchen sink included. So it's something that's very difficult to put on a microcontroller, you might, um, uh, because of its size. So let's see, how do I go to the next page? Like this. Um, so my, my initial aim with this project was just to see, is it possible to put Python on a microcontroller, um, given, it, given its size, its memory usage, and uh, its, its use in, in ROM as well. Um, the, the aim, as Gordon has pointed out, with the scripting language, you can do very rapid development of, of, uh, of your projects. It may not be the best thing to use in production, but may, to start developing something, it, it's very useful to be able to run code straight away on the board. Um, and microcontrollers have come a long way in the past 10 years, say. I remember using little AVRs with one or two K RAM a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> but nowadays, you can get very cheaply and easily these uh, STM cores uh, or anything that has a, a, a Cortex in it, um, which is very powerful, uh, still low powered, lots of RAM, lots of flash, lots of peripheral I.O., USB built in, uh, all these fancy things. It make it uh, very easy for you to do, to do complicated things very, very quickly. So microcontrollers have evolved to the point where we can start putting scripting languages on them. Uh, and so the aim of this project was to see if Python could be could be put on. Uh, it's an open source MIT license, so the code can be used in any project that you like, if you want to sell it or if you just want to use it as a hobby, that's, that's fine. Um, and it was like Gordon on Kickstarter at the end of last year and it was successful, um, successfully funded. And I'm still in the process of uh, <laughs> finishing off the Kickstarter, so the boards have been being produced uh, as we speak this week and next week. Um, and then hopefully next week I can start shipping some of the uh, first, first boards. Um, so unlike the other two talks, uh, the MicroPython project is still, uh, still sort of uh, being completed. It's not, uh, it doesn't have uh, a long history and uh, a lot of the things are still work in progress, but uh, it's, it's getting there. Um, so why did I choose Python in particular? Well, it's a high-level language, so as I was saying, that's, that's very useful for rapid prototyping. Um, and it has very powerful features, um, like list comprehension, uh, generators, exceptions, um, lots of things that make your life as a programmer much easier. Um, there's a, a very big existing community with Python for web development um, and just general programming. Uh, so that helps new users get to learn the language very quickly. Um, and also, if they need help, they can go. I mean, there, there is already a big um, user base and lots of frequently asked questions and tutorials and books for people to learn. Um, whilst being easy to learn for a, new beginner, for, for a beginner, um, it's a very powerful language for an advanced user. So it has all the features you need, like generators, uh, for example. And I think it's actually quite an ideal language for a microcontroller because it has notions, I mean, Python's been around for a while, and it has notions of bitwise operations. So AND and OR and XOR as a bitwise operation is actually something that's built into the language. And that's something that you need to use a lot in a microcontroller setting, um, because you're dealing with bits all the time. Um, so I, I think that's quite, quite a, a plus for Python. It's also procedural. You have if, else, you know, for loops, while loops, function calls, um, which sort of matches what Conceptually, when you think about programming a microcontroller, you want to do something and then something else, and a lot of things are just based on if statements. Um, so it's natural to have a language that represents that as well. Um, and the final point uh, I have on this slide is that there's lots of opportunities for optimization within Python. So um, what I mean by that is that in its, the way it's compiled, which I'll uh, talk about um, later on, it's compiled to bytecode. Um, and because it's stack-based and the way it works, you can actually optimize a lot of the calls. You, uh, constants can be optimized. Um, function calls can be optimized if you know what they are. Lookups in objects can also be optimized. So uh, it, it actually has a lot of scope as well. Not just, uh, it's not just for um, 
uh, it's not just scripting, it can also be optimized to, to the low-level hardware. I'll explain more about that towards the end. Um, so why can't I just take C Python? So C Python is the standard implementation of Python for your computer. Um, it's called C Python because it's written in C. Why can't I just take this and recompile it for the microcontroller? Um, well, I could, if, if I stripped out some of the modules and I recompiled it for the ARM instruction set, the thumb instruction set actually gives you about a two times factor decrease in code size. So if it's a megabyte on the PC, it might be half a meg and that would just fit on a, on a microcontroller. Um, so that's possible, but actually you're going to run into other problems, um, which is more to do with RAM usage. So when I make an integer in Python on, your, on my computer, um, it's actually an object that takes uh, four words. So on a 32-bit machine, that's 16 bytes. So every time I type one or two or, or, or 100 or one plus two, it's creating another object in memory and it's using four bytes to store that. So of those four bytes, the first one's a reference count, the second one is the type, the third one is the number of um, limbs in the digit and the, the fourth one is the, the first limb. So as long as your number is, fits in 30 bits, uh, it'll take four words. It also, if, if your number is larger than that, it will, it will take more bytes, but um, that be, that's because it has multiple precision numbers. But anyway, just for a number one or two, it takes four bytes. Now Python get, helps you um, with efficiency by actually pre-allocating uh, 257 positive integers and five negative integers before your program starts running. So um, these little numbers are actually efficiently, well, efficiently handled in, in that they already exist. The number one is already there. But still, that's about four kilobytes of RAM just taken up with the numbers up to 256, which is really not good for a microcontroller. Um, what I can do is put those in ROM, so make it compile to flash, because they're read-only, so that's possible. But that's still taking up precious space in ROM. Um, and it means that any other number that I type in, like a 1,000, that's not pre-made, so that takes up four bytes of memory, and that's allocated on the heap, and it may cause a garbage collection because there may not be enough memory. So even making a number is problematic. The other thing is a simple method call. So if I wanted to turn an LED on, LED.on is a method call. So this actually allocates memory in Python because it takes the LED object, it looks up the on method, and then it says this is a method. So I have to bind the, the, the self as in the LED object, LED, to the method on. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, but a method, as opposed to a function, has to have the first argument, which is sort of the, the thing you're sending the method to. That has to be passed along with the, um, with the function call. So in this case, LED and the function on have to be packaged together into a bound method, which is an object that actually takes up five words, so 20 bytes on a 32-bit machine. Um, and then when you call it, it then goes and applies that function to that object and it turns the LED on in this case. Um, so even calling a function like this, which is something you think would be very simple, actually takes memory um, and requires maybe a garbage collection. So you can't do this on a microcontroller. I mean, if, if you want to run it, you know, if you want to run this in the loop that runs millions of times per second, it, it, it's just not possible. Um, you know, and then if you have a function call with with arguments, with the integers, you're going to be allocating memory just there on the spot like this. So this is something that needs to be addressed and is why you can't just use Python as it is. Um, so the project, the MicroPython project was really all about the RAM from the beginning. Um, so all of the strings, uh, a lot of strings that you're going to use, like LED, on, off, read, write, they're already stored in memory as ob predefined objects. Um, Numbers are stuffed inside pointers so they don't take up any memory at all. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Method calls are optimized so they don't take up memory. Um, the range object, for example, if I wanted to just iterate over some numbers. So I do, in Python you do 4x in range 100. Counts from 0 to 99. Um, that, that thing doesn't quite op, um, allocate any memory in MicroPython because it's optimized away. Um, the Python stack frame, so when you call a function and you call another function and you call the interpreter and the virtual machine, none of that allocates any memory on the heap. It's just using memory on the stack as a normal C function would. Um, and in MicroPython, it, everything that I could put in ROM, I put in ROM. So 
all of the built-in modules, all the built-in functions and objects, they've all been put in wrong. Um, so uh, that, was, that was a big part of it. And so as a consequence, uh, the, when you start up the interpreter, it uses maybe 1K, 2K of RAM uh, when you're just, just sitting there at, at the prompt. Um, so inside the actual MicroPython uh, uh, compiler and uh, interpreter, there's uh, quite a few different parts uh, to, the, to the process when you type in something like one plus one. So there's a lexical analyzer, which is the first stage, which works out what you've typed in, one plus one, and turns it into a one, and a plus, and a one. Um, and then the parser turns that into a tree. So it's a plus node with one and one as two leaves, and then it understands that that should be addition. Um, so these parts of the, of the code are written uh, in ways that use memory efficiently, so you don't have to use too much RAM to compile the code. Um, the compiler itself um, tries to use as little RAM as possible, so that once you've turned your source file into a parse tree, it then makes three passes over that parse tree, um, trying to work out, uh, well, compile it, but using as little memory as possible. And the last stage of the pass over the, par over the parse tree um, is to emit bytecode. So it then calls the code emitter, which then works out the instructions that it has to execute in order to uh, do what you've asked in the script. Um, and that builds a bytecode object. Now that needs to allocate memory, that's okay. I mean, you can't get around that. Um, but the bytecode is actually not standard Python bytecode, it's sort of a compressed version. So the things that are more frequently used are, are smaller and fit in smaller bytes. Um, numbers are encoded in a variable format, so a 32-bit number, it doesn't take 32, uh, doesn't take four bytes um, if it's just one. The number one only takes one byte, you know, and then if you, if it's 256, that means two bytes and so on. So small numbers actually take up less memory um, in the byte code. So that's, the byte code is compressed as much as possible. The code emitter can also emit machine code for the, for the actual chip. So instead of byte code, you actually emit directly the hardware instructions. Um, and then after you've compiled the code, you then can go along and execute it using, there's the virtual machine which executes the byte code, or the machine code can be directly executed. Um, and at the very top, there's the runtime, which is the biggest part, and that has all of the sort of implementation of list.append or dictionary lookup or math.sign or whatever. Um, okay, so the, I'll just quickly talk about how objects are re represented. So integers are represented where the lowest bit is set to one and all of the 31 upper bits have the value. So in this way, when I make a number like one, um, it's actually just stored in a register or on the stack. It doesn't take up any heap memory. Um, and I can store all the numbers up to two billion like this. Um, and if you go beyond that, it, it has a transparent transition to arbitrary length numbers. So it actually, you, you, you have big numbers in this implementation. Um, similarly with a string, that's stored in just, in just the pointer by setting the, um, the second to last bit to one uh, as represented there. Um, and an object is when the pointer has two zeros at the end and then the x's there represent the pointer to that object. So in this way, we can store numbers without taking up memory, um, but still also have, have, have pointers to more complicated objects if we need them. Uh, all of the objects themselves can also be put into ROM. So if I can make a dictionary that's actually in flash memory in ROM, um, if I, you know, so if this dictionary is the list of methods that list um, uh, um, understands, that's actually all encoded in, in, in ROM, in flash memory. So it doesn't take up any RAM. Uh, okay, so that, that's enough about the actual way the Python interpreter works. You can ask me more questions later if you like. But this, uh, the actual hardware, so I, tr I made a little development board, um, which um, I tried to find the most powerful processor I could that was in a 64 pin package and then I could solder by hand. Uh, and that's this STM32 F405RG, uh, 192K RAM, one megabyte uh, of flash memory. It runs 168 megahertz and it has hardware floating point, which I thought was quite useful. So in, in MicroPython you have normal integers, big integers, floating point, hardware, and also complex numbers as well it can do. 
um, if you like those. <laughs> so uh, that's the, the, what the, the board is. Um, it has a USB connector, a little micro SD slot, a three axis accelerometer, which is on the, the left and the center there. Um, a real time clock, uh, crystal, four LEDs, and a, a user switch and a reset switch. Um, the I.O. pins have a symmetric layout, so the pins on the left have the same functionality as the pins on the right, uh, rotated. So if you, know, if you have a, there's an, is there a pointer? No. There's a, say an I squared C bus here, and then also one here. Um, the power pins are here, and they're also duplicated up there. Uh, so if you plug something in here, it would also work if you plugged it in up there. So you, you know, it's very easy to remember where things are. And then it has, X, because I need more I.O., there's another bunch of I.O. down here, um, which are not obviously symmetrical. Um, so <coughs> the, the way you can use it is, as Gordon was showing, um, you plug it in over USB and you get a serial device and you have a Python prompt there that runs on the board. Um, you can also through, through any US, USART um, pins and you can connect a Bluetooth module to have a serial connection. Um, you can have a, a raw prompt uh, that's kind of like remote procedure call. So I can write, I can, uh, write some C code on my, lap, on my PC here and talk to the board by just sending it Python commands. Say, okay, execute this Python command and then it returns me the result. Um, uh, you can also put scripts on the internal flash and the flash memory presents itself as a USB mass storage device when you plug it in. So if you plug it in, it looks like a USB stick as well as a serial connection. So I can copy files across to it. Um, and you can power it by battery or USB if you like. So that's the board. Uh, they're being produced at the moment at Geltec Systems in Luton. Uh, so we've been there a few times, but they are a great factory. They're very, very helpful. Uh, we've, uh, we had a few small error, well, bugs the capacitors for the, for the crystal oscillator were too large in the first, um, first uh, prototype run we did. And some of about 40% of the boards didn't work because the, they couldn't charge up the capacitor for the crystal oscillator. So we revised the crystal, the capacitance down. Um, the gel took were very helpful in, in getting, getting that through and changing the, the production for that. So, uh, there's, I'm doing a run of 3,000 boards and I think a 1,000 or so have already been done. The rest will be done next week. Um, okay, so there's this website and, and on GitHub you can find the code. I'll just quickly as possible have two minutes. So the board, the board itself is very small. Uh, I, I, that's, I tried to keep it micro so that it would be <laughs> right, it, it, it to fit in your hand. Um, and Let's see if I can get some, get something working here. Uh, so I just plug it in uh, the right way around. Okay. All right. So here is okay. So here we have a, the the prompt running on the board. So you know, one plus one is two. Yes. So one half is 0 0.5. So this is fl hardware floating point, um, and you know one j is the comp that's the complex number. Uh, hang on, that's not right. <laughs> one plus two j. Okay, that's okay. There's something wrong there. Okay. Uh, all right. That's, uh, that's uh, yeah. There's something, there's something not right with those complex numbers there. All right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so if we if we wanted to get uh, the accelerometer object, so A is the accelerometer, and I can get its x value. So if I uh, hold it station level, the x is zero. If I tilt it left it's or right, so if I do a loop. Uh, oh, actually, that's going to be too, too, way too long. Uh, and then I'll put a delay in, say 200 milliseconds. Okay, so this is the X angle of the board. 
so as I go left and then and then right, yeah. So you can see I'm just reading oops, accelerometer values like that. Uh, so yeah, control C can interrupt uh, the, the code there. Uh, and I have LED objects. But so if I if I just turn the LED on. Okay, it came on. <laughs> so, but but yeah, you have. I mean, you have all of these things. Uh, you have lists, you know. Um, so I can make lists like this. If I have a look at the. Okay, so uh, this number here. So this is how much RAM I have available. One hundred K. This is how much is used at the moment. Three hundred three thousand eight hundred eight bytes. Um, so if I, that's because I made this long list. If I do a garbage collection uh, and then have a look again, okay, I'm down to 2,448. If I do a hard, let's, uh, oops, quit, reset, and uh, nine seven six bytes uh, to do that. So this this is how much it's actually used just to. Uh, to load up and compile this this single line here, so it, it fits in. You know, the memory usage is very low. Um, okay, I think that's it, though. Thank you. Okay. Have we got some questions? I, I got one. <laughs> Concurrency. Um, yes. Have you got any additional support over and above what Python naturally provides for for um, things like event? You know, event processing and stuff. Um, well, Python provides you with generators to do sort of uh, cooperative multitasking. That's yeah. that's one thing. But uh, so you can you can schedule an interrupt, say, um, and then get it to run an arbitrary Python function. So, yeah. like you, you create uh, you can create a, a lambda, like an anonymous function, or you can just have any function, like LED dot on or whatever. Mm. And I can say when the timer expires, execute this Python code. Yeah. And that will actually execute the code on the, in the, within the interrupt, so at a higher priority. Um, so Python code can be executed um, in an interrupt directly when it's called. There's no, it doesn't schedule it to run it later. Um, so, but that's the extent of it at the moment. Uh, so, uh, like, okay, Python on chip is probably quite dead and it wasn't full language implementation at all. You mean PyMite? Python on chip? Uh, PyMite. Yeah, yeah PyMite I think it's the same yeah, name. Right. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I was thinking, how about PyPy, for instance? Oh, PyPy? Yeah. Uh, PyPy is a full, well, PyPy is a massive thing. Uh, it's a, I mean, it, it, it's like a JIT full, you know, um, <coughs> just-in-time compiling uh, to make Python very efficient. And it's like, the binary, if you compile it statically, is hundreds of megabytes. Um, that. Uh, that does have some efficiency things, like it has more efficient method calls, and uh, yeah, I think it does um, integers more efficiently as well, especially because it compiles them. But I just don't see how that would fit yeah. any way on a microcontroller. But I mean, one day maybe. Uh, do you have uh, C modules, uh, Python C modules, that you can load at runtime? No, not dynamic loading of C code. I mean, that's something that well could be done. I mean, there's no barrier to doing it, but it's not, it's not done. Yeah. And the, um, so the, the kind of the core of the Python implementation is dictionary module, right? Or dictionary implementation, which is a hash table. Yes. Do you make any, or do you make good choice of hash functionality? Do you do any optimizations or anything? Uh, the hash, well, a lot of, you can do a lot without the hash table. Uh, I mean, when you look up a method, well, that's, yeah, that's using a hash table or in some cases, a linear table if it's in ROM, because uh, if I store like the list of methods in ROM, it's just a, a table. It's just a list of you know method, 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 and it will just do a linear search. Um, but the hash function itself, well, uh, um, uh, it's the hash for strings is this just DJB2 algorithm that seems to be nice and quick and efficient and memory uh, friendly. But for integers, it's just their value. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you want, yeah, the hash function is, I mean, it hasn't been, it hasn't been optimized, but there hasn't really been a need to do that at the moment because most of the things you would do, 
the things that are time critical are like a loop where you add some numbers and, and read in an IO and write another IO, which doesn't require a hash table or a dictionary um, except to find the methods, but not a, not a dictionary like that you made and that you put items in, not a dynamic dictionary. Oh, that's, that doesn't use any RAM is what I mean by optimization there. As in, when I look up the on method in LED and I find it, um, I don't then have to create a bound method object which binds the LED instance with the function call. You still have to do the dictionary I still have to do the dictionary cop, yes, for sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I did mention that there is room for optimizing those lookups, which there are, if, but the compiler, you know, that, that's not implemented. Uh, yes, there is some constant folding uh, and there's also like jump optimization. If you jump to a jump, it just, you know, that's optimized. Uh, so the stuff that can be, yeah, I mean, most, the basic things are done, yeah, in the bytecode. But is that maybe more than what C does Yeah, it is a bit more actually. I, I tested the, so the output of the code generator was tested against Python line by line and I can get it to match exactly. But then when I turn on my optimizations, it doesn't match anymore. So it, it does do more than CPython yeah. in that sense, yeah. And is your garbage collector um, chunky? Is it chunky? Um, it's, a, it's just a simple mark sweep garbage collector. So you don't even have to even correct the decor and stuff? No, there's no, no. So yep. awesome. There's no reference counting, so that's all gone. Yeah. That, that reduces an awful lot of code size, yeah. That's, that's very good idea. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, so if I, if I make a loop that, that switches the LED on and off, it, that, that uses no memory, no RAM. I mean, it's just stack, yeah. So there's, there's, there's almost no memory usage for basic things that you do. So you said that you picked up, sorry. Yeah, why jail tech? Sorry? Why jail tech? Why jail tech? Um, good question. We, uh, we went to, a, well, we, we visited two factories and jail tech were very persistent. <laughs> but they, I mean, they gave us a good price and they, uh, the main thing I think is, they have an open book policy, so they tell you how much the components cost, how much they're making, and how much they charge you. Um, they, give, they, they tell you exactly the, the price of each single component, and they help you to reduce the price if you need to. So you say, okay, I, the, the biggest expense is the microcontroller. How do I reduce the cost? Can I buy 5,000 and only use a few of them? Or, you know, and they tell you what the mineral water quantities are and, and all these things. I mean, they're very helpful. Working with you. Yeah, exactly. They're working with us to, to help us reduce our costs instead of just saying, okay, you give us a bomb and a, and a design and we'll make it for you and ship it to you. No, no, no. I mean, we've been to the factory many times and we're working with them on the floor and seeing how it works. Um, and yeah, they're offering very good service to us. So I, I can only say good things. Okay. So um, how long, when do you have to get out of here, by the way?